Tony, what's your last name? Lewis. Or do you not want that out there? No, I'm good with that. It's Lewis. Lewis, you said? Yep. L-E-W-I-S. Nice. I'm calling this episode, Tony Lewis says you need a challenge. Or finish what you start. I like finish what you start. (laughs) Or finish what you started. Finish Uh, what you started. But do as I teach and not as I do. (laughs) Well, you can add that to it. (laughs) Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Aviation RC New Podcast. My name is Joe. I'm Matt, and we're here with special guest Tony Lewis. Hello. How you doing, Tony? I'm doing all right, guys. Yeah, we're good. Uh, Matt, you t- you spoke to me uh, actually, I think earlier this morning about maybe having Tony on. So yeah, I think that's maybe something that's been percolating in your brain for a little bit. Uh, it has been. Um, I don't know if it's because the RC Plane Lab guys did such a great interview with Tony. Actually, it's not true. Uh, Tony and I have done um, the Builder Ray Party last year together, and uh, it's just one of those things we've kind of struck up a friendship, and he's joined us at all the build parties and all that stuff. So. Uh, I just knew that as he, I guess as we started uh, working on this build ray challenge, he decided he wanted to come up with a challenge of his own to kind of dovetail into it pretty nicely. I wanted to have him talk about it. So those who are interested, and that's this is one of those challenges, and Tony will get into it in a while, um, that everybody can get part of. But uh, I was going to call this episode, Tony Lewis says, finish what you started. Because I think that's in essence... Uh, what his challenge is. So nice. Um, and so the other things we're going to talk about, of course, is all the things we've done the last couple of weeks. Um, and for me, there's been <laughs> there's been a lot because it's the end of uh, February, which is usually pretty active for me. Um, so we talk about that. We're going to talk about community things that have been going on. There's been a lot of different things. Any news uh, that's come up, and there has been, I think, a couple of regulatory news items. I think are. Uh, helpful for everybody in the hobby to know about and uh, helpful to uh, get out get out the word about. Um, we have a little bit of feedback from our community, which is wonderful. Um, and we also have uh, a little bit of history on jet fighter generations. What does that mean? And then, of course, we're going to sit down and talk to Tony about his challenge, about who he is, what he's, um, how uh, his role in the hobby and how, what ro- uh, role the hobby has played in his life. So, Let's uh, let's get into it. What do you say, guys? Well, first, first off, did we actually? I know I didn't, but did we actually introduce to, um, Tony as Flying Tiger? No. Normally, okay. we have a big list of things, but uh, Tony Lewis in our uh, Discord forum and on the FT forums, and I, Tony, you're the same in um, RC groups. Yes, I am. He is known as Flying Tiger. That's T Y G E R. Um, and then the R, R group, it's a, in parentheses, Tony. Um, and so that way we can, uh, you know, g- get in our Discord if you haven't. Um, meet the crew that kind of hangs out in the general chat channel. Uh, come to one of the build nights. Chances are if you do, you're going to meet uh, Tony because he always shows up for at least a little while. Cause he's like the rest of us building something almost every every weekend. Yeah, there's always something on my bench. <laughs> always something. It's always looking good, too, by the way. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, you you kind of keep it hybrid between foam and balsa, switching yeah. back and forth, right? He's a balsa builder, balsa designer, uh, balsa model kit extraordinaire. Actually, no, he he has de- done some design work for some companies to help them out. Um, he has a professional background that, like myself, that kind of lends into some of that, which is awesome. I want to talk to him a little bit more about his process. But without, uh, uh, is there anything else that I missed, Tony? Oh, I have no idea. 
Was I supposed to be listening? (laughs) Father. (laughs) Well, uh, so Tony participated in the Hangar RC's build challenge. Mm -hmm. What what was your plane again, Tony? Um, I did an airplane called the Crossfire, which was a foam board pattern-esque sport plane. Nice. Yep. And you're participating in uh, the Electro Street Challenge that the uh, RC Plane Lab guys are put together. So, and you're and you are doing something a little bit different than most of the guys. What what is it you're doing with that? Well, I am building an Electro Street out of foam, which is you know those guys are big balsa builders over there. Um, so I think I'm the only one doing that. And my history and background in the hobby has always been balsa up until a couple of years ago so this is really out of out of my comfort zone to do this too but yeah i thought it'd be a good comparison to see two identical planes built side by side with different materials and see just how they compare cool nice yeah well i'm eager to see how it turns out it looks it's already looking good um yeah, i can see it kind it. of all all tied up <laughs> yeah so it looks it's kind of like piled up next to me right now so nice cool all right well then why don't we get into um what have we been up to in the last couple of weeks uh tony you want to start off the sure the thing or yeah the last couple of weeks i've been uh trying to wrap up my build jewelry projects uh i was lucky enough to finish the first build pretty early on um and then I got going on this electric streak, and there I kind of ground to a stop. So this last week for work for me has been a little bit hectic, and that delayed the process a little bit, or cut into my building time, I should say. Um, but yeah. I still got it about three quarters framed up. Um, should be able to get it done here in the next couple of weeks. Cool. Yeah, because uh, when does the deadline on that? When are they aiming for? First day of spring, uh, is it? I think they said the first day of spring. So March 20th, maybe? March 21st, I think. Okay. It's it's sooner than I want. <laughs> it's going to come a sure. lot faster than it than it seems right now. So. Yeah. I, I think if I build uh, a wing or two or maybe a fuse, I'll consider myself way ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. That sounds like you've been really busy the last couple of weeks. Yeah. That's you life. Like that? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, Joe, what about you? Uh, I have beat my head against the wall some more with 3D printing. I know I did that whole episode last time Yeah. about it, uh, pretending to know what I was talking about, and obviously I don't because um, I am continuing to have heat creep issues. Mm-hmm. So, a um, couple things I want to look at, open that hot end back up, because I'm. it's still swelling, the filament's swelling inside the Bowden tube. Hmm. So, I need to open the um, open the hot end up, make sure that um, air is moving freely across the, the cooling grills, uh, make sure that the fan is pushing air the way it's supposed to, uh, and then... If all that's good, I may go ahead and swap the filament because I have a I've ordered in a roll of my hatch box, I think, or something another mm-hmm. filament that was uh, the the roll that came with it, I think, and I had good results with that, as I recall. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, and if I'm pretty. if I'm still having issues, then I may have to dial the temperature back, um, even though I'm only at 215 degrees. Celsius. Um, it's PLA, right? Yes, yeah, PLA. That's pretty hot. I usually go around 205. It's where I get mm. pretty good results. Um, I, each filament is a little different, but uh, yeah, 215 think, seems uh, a little bit too hot for me. So two, 220, I was seeing stringing issues. Mm-hmm. Um, 215 seemed to have resolved some of that. Um, and I know with the Eclipse and stuff. Oh, that's right. You're printing single wall. Yeah, you have to go a little hotter, right? You're right. My mistake. Oh, do you? Yeah. I mean, so that makes sense. If you're getting decent results with single wall at 215, that's about right. That's it. They recommend 5 to 10 degrees hotter than, you know, standard. Like if you're building a big chunk, 
fulfillment, you know? Well, see, I don't know anything about all that. Um, but yeah, it's, I just really shouldn't be having this problem. So I'm curious to see no. if the other filament brand, uh, has the same problem. And okay. if it does, then it's just gotta be an airflow. Cause I didn't used to have this problem. Um, so we'll see, but okay. yeah, that's what I'm, that's mostly what I've been doing in the hobby, uh, non hobby. I'm finally getting around to painting night stands to go in the bedroom Ooh. that I've spent over a year remodeling. That honeydew list that's, is getting done. No, no, there's always more being added to it. But, no, no, um, I mean, that part of that list is getting yeah. done. <laughs> nice, yeah. good, cool. Only and a year and a um, half. Yeah, well, you figure I started uh, remodeling the bedroom during COVID. Um, COVID kicked off, and that's when we started in the bedroom. Uh, we emptied it out and peeled everything off the walls, all the wallpaper and all. And, uh, yeah, it took me way too long to get us back in there. Well, I started my kitchen when we moved into this house in the end of 2018, and last week I finally put the drawer pulls on the cabinets. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> yeah. It's it feels good to call it good. Exactly. So um nice. Yeah. Other than that, uh kind of trying to get the man cave straightened up uh so I can have a build oh, yeah. surface look in at, here again. Look at that. I can see a table in the background now. Yeah, well, that's had a little bit of stuff on it. And then Yeah, but I mean it would I, I couldn't even see it before, so good. Was it really that bad? Um, we'll look behind me. I mean, can, you know, it was well, a, I know more what yours that looks way. like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've still got the Flurkin back there. I just pulled the, might have been the Mini Sparrow out. Okay. Um, it's obviously still in the package, but I think I might take a couple hours over the course of the next few nights and kind of try to whip that together. I don't have... A motor for it, and I probably won't put the servos in unless they have to be put in as part of construction, but just to have built something. Yeah. Now, you said that's, um, that's an F-Pack that you're missing, right? F or A. It's, okay. you know, because they're the same footprint. Yep. Yeah, I get um, you. And it's fine. Hobby funds are there. I just haven't ordered it. I got you. Yeah. That's all right. So, I mean, you know, look, if you don't have an airframe to put it in, there's no big rush yet. Well, the tiny trainer sitting out there built, no servos, but put it on Prime, get it in there, get it there today. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm kidding around. No, you know that's good. Then you have a couple planes ready, and you can go and have a, uh, you know, a little bit of fun whenever you feel like it. Because they're, they're actually easy, they're easy to fit in your car, you know. Yeah, actually, um, in a few weeks, my part of the reason the man cave's getting cleaned up. A few weeks, my wife has some friends coming down, uh -huh. so this room needs to be cleaned up so beds can be set up. Oh, okay, yeah. But I want to get kicked out of the house for the weekend. Oh, what weekend is that? Um, well, whatever. We can talk about that out, uh, off the air. Cause yeah. We should try to plan on getting together if we can. Uh, We could try. Um, I know my mother is wanting to try to go fishing over that weekend. Mm -hmm, all right. Um, But I bring that up because... Uh, I may try to take that opportunity to, uh, maiden the seven. If my mother wants Ooh. to go, okay. uh, go out to the fly field, I can take the sore and then maybe the seven and finally try to put the seven in the air. Yeah. I, I did, you know, speaking of that's part of the things I did in the last couple of weeks is I, I did get my seven up in, I'll call it working order, but only barely. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I think I think I'm coming to the conclusion that I, I don't think it's going to fly again. I need to rebuild it. I've got a plan uh, laid out on the sheets so that I can build a new one pretty quickly. So I think I might just end up doing that. Um, nice. Anyway, so so is that pretty much what you've been up to in the last couple of weeks? Sounds like you'll be busy. Yeah, I'll be busy. I've been busy. Um, not a whole lot with the hobby, but I don't know. I kind of want to try to knock out a couple easy builds and maybe mm -hmm. not put all the electronics in them because since the room has to be straightened up and since somebody's going to be staying in here, I could, mm -hmm. you know, ha have that plain gallery in here that oh. I want to go for anyway. Yeah, good. So we'll see. All right. What about you? 
Well, uh, it's the last half of the Build Rory Challenge. Uh, the you know four builds, four weeks. Good luck. Um, so I worked on trying to get the F one seventeen in the air, which is my replacement for the B two bomber, because I realized that B two bomber is going to be more of an undertaking than I was going to be able to handle. Mm -hmm. The F one seventeen went together really quick. Um, unfortunately, I have yet to be able to get in the air despite tw two different attempts, and uh, one exploded edf and then the other edf i uh literally pulled a bunch of wires to pieces um so huh. i guess a, a, a wire lead kind of got partially sucked in and and then all the plastic stripped and some of the metal which might have caused a short and i might have lost another rx so i'm i think i'm gonna have to start buying uh receivers in bulk <laughs> the way i'm going through them oh, that's awful anyway uh, so we got that. Uh, let's see. I flew the special K again, which, you know, got that up in working order and it, it flew pretty good. And I was like, okay, let me set, let me reset the trims. You know, as we discussed what you're supposed to do after you've done the first flight, you go, oh, these are kind of way off. Let me reset them to what the zero point should be and send them out again and kind of do another retrim and then just mm -hmm. kind of hone that in. Well, second time I went out after I redid it, um, it got into another dive. And, uh, I was not able to, I was able to pull out just enough, um, for it to skim across the weeds where the nice. landing, the landing gear, yeah, except the landing gear and the, the props caught, were caught by the weeds and the whole thing <laughs> just ripped both motors off as it kind of like nose down into the, <laughs> like I came up and I'm like, yeah. And it's like, nope, <laughs> just grabbed hold not of it. So and, nice. And slammed it. The plane is in great shape. The pods and the nacelles are done, and both props were busted. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a complete goner, but it's in the middle of a build where it was not a time I was going to be able to repair it. So I'm I'm putting I'm going to add that to my another list of things to go fix in this coming month, Tony. Um, and then uh, I also had the the wonder wonder, the the wonder bread wonder. Um, I okay. had, uh, pre I went out with, uh, Amy and she brought her plane and, and flew it or whatever. And then I flew mine. Cause I was like, Oh, we'll get this tested. The F-117 didn't work. The other plane I had wasn't doing terribly well. And I was like, well, I'll just, I brought the wonder. Cause like, well, it usually flies pretty well. I'll just put stuff in it and I'll just go fly that. Right. Have a win for the day. Even if nothing else was. I threw it and apparently the elevator, I didn't even check, but was about 10 degrees down. Ooh. So it just nosed whomp, right into the ground, <laughs> broke a prop and uh, hurt my feelings, broke a firewall. Um, but a couple of weeks, uh, about at the end of the week, I had repaired that. And just the other day, I threw it back in the air and it flew around and had, we had a great time with it. So nice. Yeah. And then last but not least, it's the last build I had built. It's the last build I completed, and it was the one I put into the air on the 28th of February, which is the very last day of build -away, which was the FT style. So the kind of chunky fold-over segmented kind of airfoil of the Prandle D that is uh, swept back at about like 17-degree angle. Um, and I put that in the air, and it flies pretty well and flies – Maybe not as smooth. There's a little bit of waggle going on. I think I might have actually had it set almost at the CG. Uh, had a pretty far aft. I, I really need to add a little bit more weight in the nose. Um, but with the 2200 battery and F pack on a four cell, I think. No, on a three cell. Uh, she cooked around the sky pretty well. And uh, she did all the Prover Shaw stuff that the Prandle D is supposed to do. And it was just a joy to kind of watch and have her fly around. And she would go real slow and you know, and then she could, you know, kind of book a little bit, but she's a bit squirrely. Um, I need to dial back the rates quite a bit or dial back the throw levels quite a bit. So I might mess around with that a little bit in the coming days, but uh, she's going to be one of those ones I have in the, in the pocket to go out and have a good time with. Mm -hmm. um, and then last, uh, but not least, it's not me, but uh, uh, Amy uh, Red Phoenix on our, on our discord. Um, she took the little F 22 that she has the easy, style 22 and she was flying it at dusk with because <laughs> we were out there that's about when I ever I get a chance to fly and uh, she started flying away and the wind I guess took her you know it took her downwind more than it took her up you know 
And uh, I guess she, she got out there. I'm like, you need to bring that back or, or let it go. Like cut the throttle and let it go to the ground and we'll just kind of try to pinpoint it. And uh, so she said, no, 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 I got it. It's coming back. And it wasn't. It was going away. And so she let it kept going away and away. And the lights <laughs> started to blur into the background. And then all of a sudden I started losing the sound and the background noise of the train way off in the distance. And I'm like, oh. And she's like, no, no, it, it'll be fine. I, I know, I know what direction, I mean, do you know exactly what direction it is? She's like, it's over there-ish, you know? And I'm like, oh. And this, five, five, a five degree swing of over there-ish is a big yeah. area when you get way out. Yeah, there. when you get about three football fields out, it's a large swath. And she's like, well, it's still binding. I'm like, that's a football field in any direction. Is that, that tells you where it is. Good luck. That's a long. That's a big area to cover, you know? And just, just to clarify, because I you were telling me the story this morning, and <laughs> the question that came into my mind was, did you use the transmitter mm-hmm. to do the, the signal test? Because you can do like that signal scan. Kind of go left and right and left and right to right, kind of Right, and kind of sweep it, right? your antenna, but she wasn't using a uh, transmitter that could do that, right? No, it was the El Cheapo brand, you know, the kind that the uh, FT Easy Pack has, where it's literally... Uh, it has a uh, throttle up, down, and it has aileron left, right, which which right. is a differential thrust, and that's it. There's there's a high rate maybe, and there's so it's on off, and then that's it. There's nothing fancy about it. So um, there's no servos to try to wiggle in here when you're looking for it either, and those motors are so quiet. Right, the motors are so quiet, and it, it doesn't take much but a blade of grass to stop it from spinning. Yeah. So if it got caught in some weeds, it you wouldn't be able to hear it. I'm like, all, like, all you got to do is hear just a little bit of motor and we can have a pinpointed direction. Like, we can have something to go by. Meanwhile, you know how far that lake is? No. Yeah, where, so you know, you know where the base of that, uh, the watering trestle is? Way off to the left? Where are we talking? At you know, your at, flight field? At my flight field. Way yeah, off to the left. I was out there once. Okay, so I figured you're always watching my videos because they're amazing. No. Okay. You're right. I'm sorry. Of course. I know exactly <laughs> the pond you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. So uh, ultimately, it's like it's way out there. Honestly, this is the first time I've actually gone so far enough to actually see it. And she's like, maybe it's out there. So I'm like, no. <laughs> this thing lost. My planes lose signal when it goes this far out, you know? Anyway, mm. so she unfortunately lost it. This was her first experience losing it. She had a, a pretty, we, we had wet feet because it was right at the dew point. So pretty much from the knees down, we're just sopping wet. Our shoes were squeaking. Oh, yeah. You know? It's like, oh. I'm like, I'm so sorry. And she's like, don't Good worry. Times. You know, this was fun. Uh, it's not super expensive. I know that I enjoy this, and I'm looking forward to kind of getting back into it soon. Um, there you, you know. go. And then, you know, Logan had his little Cessna out, and he's sitting there complaining that he wasn't landing it within 10 feet of himself. He was landing it like 15 feet away, you know, like, dude, <laughs> you're doing great. Don't worry about it. Have a hey, good time, you know. At least he's that good and he wants to get better. Exactly. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, I need to finish up. Um, a, probably a glider would probably be a good plane for him to start with. Um, although he could probably fly anything at this point. Um, any, any rel- like an old fogey kind of like gentle starter plane that gives him enough time to make a mistake or two. But yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. It's going to be a busy next couple of weeks, probably just enjoying some flying for a while instead of doing too much building. Although I do have a bunch of things on my list of uh, this uh, community challenge that Tony has brought up. Um, speaking of, let's talk about some, let's get into our community stuff. Let's talk about build nights. We have upcoming build nights. Um, we have one that just happened this past Friday on the 3rd, um, but we have one coming up on March 24th on Friday, and that'll be in the evening. Um, and then we have one in April 15th, and that'll be between like 11 and 3 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the other thing is um, maybe, Tony, this would be a good time to talk about your challenge a little bit. All right. Yeah, so I had this grand idea. Actually, it comes from the RC Groups forum site of hosting a challenge where the premise is take a plane that you've had sitting in the corner of your workshop, stuffed up in a rafter, 
you know, just collecting dust or even something that you had finished previously and crashed or needs some tweaks, get it back on the bench, get it done, get it added to your fleet and get it ready to go for this summer. Um, you know, there's a bunch of us that took on Bilduary and only a few that actually managed to finish and complete completely 100% finish four airplanes. So yeah, not we're, easy. we're ripe with, you know, extra projects right now. And this is a good opportunity. Um, you know, I'm up in the Northern region where it's still winter and reminds us every day that we're not able to fly yet. So this is the perfect time to, to not give up on those, but to buckle down and, and try to get some of these done before the weather changes so that we've got a, a little better collection to, to go through this summer. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Uh, so essentially, gra- grab that plane in the corner that you hadn't finished up yet and yeah. get on it. Yeah, the only prerequisite is you had to have done something with it prior to March 1st. Um, I mean, and it could be as simple as you bought the kit. You cut a piece out. Good enough. <laughs> I glued on two pieces after Jesse built a quarter of a flurkin. That's Perfect. Pl- plenty. Get the flurkin and, done. It's time. And honestly, <laughs> in my mind there, too, if you picked up a partially built airplane, that's a project that's been started. Even if it wasn't started by you, it's a project that's in process, not completed. It qualifies. There you go. Nice. Now, you call this, let's see. It's on the flight test forums. It's the 2023 Spring Sprint Wrap-Up Challenge, right? Yeah, it's um, trying to be creative. Somebody already had, you know, the the top top slot for Bilduary. It's, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to rhyme or or come up with some pun punny name off of March or April or spring. So. That's about the yeah, best I'm, I'm sitting with. here trying to think of something and nothing's coming to mind. Yeah, yeah I don't. Yeah, I thought no. about it for a couple of weeks. I found some words that rhyme with orange, but I couldn't come up with anything funny for the challenge. <laughs> really? <laughs> what rhymes with orange? Uh, I, I, nothing. Nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I mean, nothing rhymes with orange. It's perfect. <laughs> nothing rhymes with orange. I just meant that it was that hard to come up with something. <laughs> yeah, oh. I, I'm not exactly the most creative guy when it comes to stuff like that anyway, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Look, I'm just, I'm just w- hanging here with my mouth open, sticking my foot in over and over again. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, you get used to the taste after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have a point system, which is uh, a one point per month of age from the original start date from the the first of March, right? So yep. basically, like if how <laughs> the older that project has been, the longer that's been sitting on your shelf to get finished, the more points you get for it. Yeah, yeah and, and there too, the incentive was just to to go back and, and get people to start thinking about some of them that have really been sitting around for a while. You know, yeah. a lot of us have ones that we kind of petered out on a project and it might be sitting nearby, but the ambition to get it done isn't there anymore. But there's something mm-hmm. else that's back in the closet that we forgot we had that after it sat for a, a year or so, you go back and look at it and go, oh, you know... That really was a good, you know, a neat, interesting model. And man, that really would be cool to get done. And you kind of start to get that motivation to finish it back just because it's been, it's been long enough. You forgot the frustrations that drove you to putting it aside the first time. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's a bunch of things that kind of come along. You're like, oh, that thing. And, you know, sometimes it's like having your mind percolate over how to get it done. And it's just been so long. He's like, well, when it comes up, I'll, I'll deal with it. And then, you know, then the point never came up, but now is a perfect excuse to go do that. I know I've got about three or four projects, actually way more than that, but three or four projects that have been from the ancient days where I did what I could and either it didn't work and I had ideas on how to fix it, but I was just tired of the project. And it's like, uh, you know, I'll just, when I start over again, it'll be time to do it. And, you know, the flying submarine is still one of my favorite challenges to, I, I want to see it fly. 
and I haven't been able to do that yet. Um, the Robotech VF1 Finder or VF, I can't, 7, I think is what it is. The Ford Swept uh, Wing Finder. I definitely want to get that. And I would actually love to have that fly, even if it's like uh, poorly, you know? Um, I just, you know, I threw it, it failed, and I didn't come back to really do much with it. And I, I really should, you know. Those, those are the kind of ideas. Let's see, five points for creating and finishing a detailed build thread. So basically kind of putting back, you know, putting that effort into finishing up what you started in the first place, right? Yep, and also encourage activity on the forums. It's good to, it's a good way to keep each other motivated, to cheer mm-hmm. each other on and, and to drive a little um, traffic, you know, across across the message boards there. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and that's part of what I, ca- I forgot to highlight about Build Your Worry is not, on top of you doing your own stuff, which is hard enough, right? <laughs> uh, what I what I failed to kind of highlight is, hey, make sure to go to all of these other people's build pages and watch them. Just hit the watch button. And that way, when they're posting new things, you get to go in and kind of say, hey, oh, wow, look at that. You did great. Or, oh, that's a bummer that that toss didn't go so well. Or, you know, ho- however the, the attempt goes, you know. Um, but to have like kind of cross, cross activity of encouragement. I mean, that's kind of what the forums are about for me. Exactly. And I got to say this year for build Jewelry, the quality of some of the builds that I saw on people's threads. Holy uh, yeah. smokes. Every, every year there's like three or four people who just like, what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, there were, there's a, a good half dozen, if not more builds that just really astonished me the fact that you could get one done in a month some of these guys did multiples yeah um, yeah 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 impressive performances here there's a couple that really knock it out and it's just like whoa that's that's an impressive build and you did how many of those <laughs> you know it's good so my hat's off to everybody who took part in that challenge even if you just you know put your hat in the ring and gave it a thought or two you know um like Jesse uh, Zediak, he decided he's like, I'm going to do it this year. And he like had that big giant pile of foam, like, oh my gosh, he's going places this this year. And he ended up basically getting like three quarters of the way through on, I think three of them. And one of them he finished. Um, But he's like, yeah, but I'm like three quarters of the way through on three builds. I want to see finished. So that's really, you know, that's pretty cool. Further than I did then. I know. (laughs) I think so. But he, yeah, he, that was pretty fun. I'm, I'm actually eager to see. I'm going to make sure that he joins this challenge you put up here so that I can see those three that he put on there to see him finish, you know. Let's see. And you also have five, three, and one bonus points to the top three scores of a poll. So basically you're going to kind of put everybody up on a poll to see who gets the highest votes for, like, the, the best uh, completion, I guess. Yeah, just a community popularity. I, I, yeah. I hesitate to use the word popularity, but... It's a, yeah. it's a beauty contest in, in a, some sense, you know, there's a lot of people that'll vote for the one that is the most complicated or most complex or just plain interests mm-hmm. them the most. And then there's some that'll vote for the one that looks the best, you know, it, it doesn't yeah. really matter. And that's why I didn't want to put a lot of weight on that, but it's, right. it's really nice to see to be able to pull the the final pictures of everybody's efforts together and, and put them up there and, and have everybody kind of chime in and, you know, just another opportunity for some, some attaboys and. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty good idea. I think I might start doing how oh, I always hesitate to do that. Cause I never seem to have quite the time I hoped. Um, to like pull everybody's like, this is where everybody ended on their, this is what they wanted to do. And this is where they ended like two pictures side by side on each like entry. Like here you went, this is how far you got. And like kind of run down that. So everybody can kind of see it at a glance, um, you know, and then maybe the point total at the end. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to figure out how to do that. But that's, th- I think it's a good point system. It's enough to kind of encourage those old builds to kind of pull back out from the depths. Um you know, and get people to kind of engage with who aren't in the challenge to engage with what people are doing. Yeah, I just, you know, building is such a, a a big part of the hobby for me. And I really like to advocate for guys to build their own stuff and 
um, mm -hmm. you know, prior to getting real familiar with the flight test, you know, community, you know, as an old time balsa builder, we saw a lot of the, the building starting to fall by the wayside and more and more of guys going to pre-built airplanes and ARFs and ready to fly stuff. And, right, you know, it was refreshing yeah. to, to come over to the flight test community and see how many guys are, are <laughs> building, building like, like crazy. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a good place to advocate and keep that, that, uh, part of the hobby alive. Nice. Nice. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And that's part of why I do the build -ray. Again, it's to highlight um, how simple and easy most flight test uh, kits are to build. And just generally that construction method is, is, it feels like it's a lot quicker than most other build methods. You can see your ideas take shape pretty quickly. So just trying to highlight that, you know, you really can do a lot in a very short amount of time if you put your mind to it. You don't have to you know, do it too hard. I think, um, I, I'm, I'm sure you ran into this too, but it's always like other things happen. This deceptively simple challenge that we both did last month that it's like, oh, it's only four. It should be easy. I can do one of these in a night, you know, and <laughs> I got 28 days. This should be simple. And you realize sooner or later that you're like, I'm out of time. Uh, all the stuff happened and I did not get the time I hoped. Um, Oh well, <laughs> I got yeah. builds. Yeah, you know? it's, and then now it's, I got now I got not, a challenge to look forward to. Yeah, during that you're not, you know, exempt from the real world and the real life. You know, uh, no. I I haven't been to Flight Fest yet, but you know, hearing stories about oh. that and hearing how people can build, sit in the build tent and build airplane after airplane at Flight Fest, and then you think, well, if I can do it there, I can do it, you know, in four yeah. weeks at home. But at home, yeah. there are so many distractions that can derail <laughs> any progress. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how some little thing can just kill any <laughs> any chance to get down and work on something. Right. Hey, can we go play basketball? Hey, look, it's beautiful outside. Let's do this thing. Or look, it just snowed. You know, time to go get out the shovel. That's right. You know. So speaking of Flight Fest, are you going to make it this year? Yeah. That's the plan. That's nice. the plan. Yeah, man. Yeah. We'll, we'll so, have a huge get together at Flight Fest this year. Yeah, we have yeah, to do it. I'm I'm excited about it. It's been a while since I've been to a, a big event like that, and I'm yep. I'm really I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it is big. Though I am concerned about I don't know if how much this year will be impacted, but years to come. And Matt, I know you're going to talk about this kind of I in will. a bit, but with a lot of the stuff coming down the pipeline, how feasible and long uh, some of this is going to be in the future. Okay. Well, let, I think it kind of what you're about to talk to and what I'm what I'm going to bring up. Um, it also dovetails into another part of our community efforts that we've been working on is we've more or less, I think we finalized with Spons what we want for the noob wonder. And he said he should be able to get that by the time this thing airs, he'll have it out that week. Uh, and it'll be on the flight test forums. I believe is where he's going to post it. And it's the noob wonder. It's, it's a no frills version of the FT wonder. Uh, the tail feathers look very much like our logo. Um, it's probably kind of how it sets us. Uh, and, and our build version of the Noob Wonder or of, of the FT Wonder. Or is it Spawn's Wonder? What is that? Did I goof it up? What is that called? I think it's. I think he's calling it the Spawn's Wonder. It's based on okay. the Sig Wonder. Yeah, it's based on the Sig Wonder. Not, not yeah, to this... be confused with the Bloody Wonder, which was the, the FT design. Y yeah, exactly. And that's that's why I do. it's like, don't, don't mess it up, Matt, but I messed it up. Anyway, so, <laughs> but the Spawn's Wonder. But so basically this is our version. So it'll have slightly different tail feathers, a different kind of, more of a planky um, wing look. Because it should be stupid simple. The, if you're a noob, this is a plane to go build. It's durable. I literally threw my plane as hard as I could into the dirt. I had the propeller push it faster into the dirt than I could throw it. Okay. And it came back as like, a, oh, let me just put a new firewall on, tape the nose, and we're ready to go. And it worked great. So mm -hmm. it's an incredibly durable build. It's um, strong. It's also simple and fast to build. 
and you won't regret it. And you can, I think I'm using a 2212 um, 1400 KV motor, those orange can. You can get them anywhere, put them on a three cell oh, 2200. Yeah, so it's a jet uh, brand, right? It's not, I don't even know. There's a brand. I mean, it's that generic. But they're it's, they're yeah. sold under about eighteen different brand names. <laughs> exactly, I think. Well, I can say the the uh, it's the same one in the amazing durability and praise that you're giving this, mind you, is for the Spawns Wonder. Yeah, it's for the Spawns variants. Uh, we'll see how the Noob Wonder does because yeah, we got to test those, it still uh, officially. But uh, the, those tail feather wing tips. Uh, I think Spawns, I think, had, well, I know certainly had his doubts about, so we'll see. I, I think, I think we'll show that how that goes. They're better than he thinks. Um, and it's he what it looks like. designed the thing. I know, because those tail feathers don't really, whatever. They do some, but it's not that I, much. I think because they're, they're fairly pointy, I think the tips and things are going to be subjected or, you know, prone okay. to being dinged up and bent. But maybe I don't think it's gonna do anything to affect the flight. I, I think it'll be just fine in the air. And yeah. I'll say I, they're they're strong airframes. Like the basic airframe is is really tough. Um, the one uh, the German version I built for the prototype, mm -hmm. I put a oh what was it a twenty eight twenty outrunner in it. I. I think okay. it's pretty close to like what they sell for the XL Scout. Yeah, yeah, it's a big, that's a hefty motor. <laughs> yeah, um, you can run like a twelve, a twelve inch by ten yeah, or something. Like, yeah, I put a really, <laughs> I, I was running like a ten by eight prop on it. I oh mean, it, it literally flew out of my hand at a half throttle. It, it just had a ton <laughs> of power. I tried my best to fold the wing in flight to the point mm -hmm. that I actually got the hatch to to fly off. Yeah, my um, hatch is gone. Yeah, Every time I, I do it, <laughs> couldn't couldn't bend it one bit. So they're nice. they're tough mm. planes. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, with that orange can, you can run a nine by six, which gives it enough power to do any acrobatics. And it's a, designed as a combat plane. You won't be disappointed. Give any one of them a try. As a matter of fact, Tony, you designed your own version of it, right? Well, I inspired Spawns to to create a version. Okay, well, t <laughs> tell us a little bit about it, because that's one of the things, uh, when we get into talking to you for a minute, I do want to talk about uh, the things that you've inspired others either to do or to take um, your core idea and kind of, I'll call it, pa pulse it out in, in their way um, to bring something new to the hobby. So the, the whole backstory to this, well, for one, I'm a huge fan of the air racers especially like the 1930s and specifically the gb racers mm -hmm. the one and, that looks like it's all prop and all motor and nothing yeah the else. big the big barrel so i uh when i was doing the german version i had painted it yellow and i was sitting outside waiting for the paint to dry just kind of looking at it and i sent a picture to dan and i said man i am really tempted to just paint black gb scallops on this thing and he's like that's a great idea we need to do a gb version <laughs> and i'm like all right i got too much on my plate already i can't i can't you know even start to entertain this yeah that night i had a sketch over to him color and everything <laughs> say man look at what i came up with and he he just ran with it and said that's awesome yeah so, it looks he, so uh, good too he put together uh, the the Wonder Racer version and uh, sent those off my way, and we threw a prototype together for that quick. And... Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. I had a little part in that, but I, I can't really take credit for the design itself. But I don't know. You should, I think you should. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, it's, it's awesome. Honestly, I saw the, the quick picture of it. it. It looks really good. It gets the essence of the GB. Um and the, the color scheme is always that's one of my favorite color schemes in general it's just yeah uh, kind of iconic so um, and it's still yeah. ambiguous enough that you could take that same airframe and put you know any kind of paint job from any of those racers back in that era mm -hmm. and it would look right um yeah with the rounded wingtips and that i mean you could paint it like a piper cub and it's still gonna look right um yeah it's just kind of got that 30s vibe to it yeah it does but it, there's something about it it just yeah i'm with you 
That's exactly right. And that's part of what I, so look, look for it and, you know, know that Tony helped inspire that for sure. Um, I think I saw you post a picture or something of it. Maybe why I attribute it mostly to you. Um, it just it looks so good. Um, well, good. Let's see. Um, other community stuff I want to take. Maybe we can take this moment to thank our patrons. Uh, that's I know, Tony, you are in that boat. So I want to thank you for helping keep this podcast uh, going and giving us the motivation to kind of keep at it every week when there's some weeks we go, oh, I don't know. Um, but uh, no, we, we do... Uh, do that and if you if you can't join us on patreon and help us out uh, monetarily you can help us out even more by reaching out to your friends who enjoy aviation and say hey these these guys you might want to listen to they're a lot of fun i enjoy them um, so kind of spread the word if you can um, pass us along to three different friends maybe one of them enjoys it and you can share that when you meet um, uh, let's and you see the don't other... have to be a noob Despite no. it being the Aviation RC Noob podcast, you don't have to be a noob to enjoy it. I mean, I came into this, into the community and into your Discord with, you know, quite a few years of experience. You can always learn more, especially with how fast everything changes, um, you know, with the technology and everything that we're using. So Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, yeah. So yeah, it's I mean we we cater to new guys because I want to see more people get in the hobby. But at the same point, I and I've gotten a lot of feedback from different people who are of varying ages in the hobby. You know, some people who just started and they're like, "Holy cow, you guys have all the stuff that I want to know about." This is great. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're here, and it's fun to listen to. Matter of fact, we got a feedback that I was hoping uh, when when uh, Joe could read in a little bit. And then we also have guys who are like you who've been in it a while and who are like, I, what I love here, J Tony, what was it you told me the other time? You're like, there are people who are active here. You just, you know, I, I go on RC groups. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of stuff going on over there, but it's not as active as this. You come over here to the podcast and you come over to the discord, even in flight test forums. And there's people building new and trying different and, you know, getting at it. Yeah, the hobby, like anything else, it ebbs and flows, and fads come and go, and yeah, it it tends, a lot of times communities get stale, they get stuck in one specific type of interest, and it's mm -hmm. really good for a while, and then it kind of runs its course, and if there isn't new blood coming in, or, or change of ideas, then it just kind of mm -hmm. plateaus, and you know, over here, you guys got so many, there's so many people like in the Discord that are doing so many different things and yeah. posting about it and talking about it and just having that much, you know, out there to look at, you know, you look at it once, you look at it twice, you keep hearing them talk about this project and all of a sudden you go, you know, that sounds really interesting. I had no interest in that prior to this, but now after watching <laughs> somebody go through it, you go, yeah. you know, there's a whole lot more to that than I thought. Um, and it, it starts to motivate you to try something new. And every time mm -hmm. you do something new, you learn new tricks and you advance your, your skill set. And... Yeah. Do you, uh, almost like, uh, uh, now I'm going to, I did it again, Joe. I forgot his name Mutley. as I'm, yes, Mutley. But like, I, I saw that video <laughs> with his uh, aim, full scale aim. Was it aim seven? Is that? Uh, are you talking about the missile? Yeah, the missile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, so I saw, I watched it a, a few minutes of it while I was at work. So I didn't have the audio on. I couldn't hear what he was saying. I just saw this. He hand launched this missile. He was just kind of talking about how it was doing some weird, weird yawing action here and there. Okay. Um, it was doing well, certain I definitely things. Definitely saw but, that. And he was just hoping that people could see it. And that's kind of all he was saying. But the rest was just watching it. It was really cool. When really cool to see that. think about the idea of building a missile, and this isn't like a missile-shaped airplane. It is a honest-to-God <laughs> missile. missile. It looks missile. like a rocket. It doesn't have <laughs> yeah. oversized wings or control surfaces or anything. And you look at this and go, no. that's not going to fly like an airplane. There's no way. There's and no you way. look at I, it and go, it's a missile. There's you you kind of formulate what you expected to fly like when right. you watch his flight 
it, if I don't know how I it have no air. idea how it flies the way it does. It is incredible. And I told him that too. I'm like, this is the most amazing thing I've seen in a long time because it it just blows away any idea that you had in your head as to how this was gonna work. Like it it it's something to behold. Well it's a it seems to be very much a high alpha flat wing uh that kind of half hangs on the props i say half hangs but are half suspended by because they're pushers it's yeah it, it's weird it's weird because <laughs> i watched it fly and i was just like what yeah it's crazy when he's what? like hey the cg is like right here and that's like right behind the front fins and i'm like that doesn't seem right at all. I mean, I don't know anything <laughs> about rockets. I, I My brain just shuts off, apparently, when they talk about how to balance a rocket. It seems really simple. But at the same point, I'm like, there's no way that's going to work. And yeah, then, sure I, enough. You're talking about a seven or eight foot long tube with <laughs> yeah. eight fins on it that are about the size of a sheet of paper. Like, that's there's it. nothing about that that says it should fly well. It, it no. should fly slow. <laughs> It'll be very controllable. Like, none of that makes sense. And when you see it fly, I mean, it flies incredibly well. Like, I, I couldn't yeah. believe it. I, I know he wanted it to fly um, probably a little bit more consistently, a little bit less wobbly. But, like, it was floating. I mean, it was just kind of gentle. It was almost like watching an old fogey go around, you know? Yeah. I, I, would, ought to re- I, I don't know if he said anything. but Ethan Jacobs. Again, I, I, did, I didn't have the, the audio turned up. But I wonder if he's going to rebuild that or, or repair it and have that for combat. At yeah. Fest. Oh, it is. Yeah. And he said okay. he goes, he caught it and it, it messed up a little bit. And he's like, ah, I'll repair that damage. That's a, that's minor. Yeah, we'll have this ready. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I, I think what he's going to try to do is probably tweak it a little bit more so it can fly faster. But I think that's kind of his intent is to find, mm. <laughs> launch that when they launch a big build and try to take it down with the missile. Well, Tony, thank you for your very kind words about the community. Um, yeah, thank you. That, that means a lot. And in following up on uh, other f- kind words and kind of moving along a little bit, because I think we're approaching the one hour mark and we uh, maybe have uh, caused Tony to uh, sign up for more than he expected uh, <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> Uh, I got an email today, or we got an email, and I shared it with you. Yeah. Um, from Justin. Uh, first email we've gotten in a little while, I think. He said, love the podcast with four exclamation marks. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I just found your podcast in February. Great info, fun format. As I listen to episode 35 this morning at work, it dawns on me that you guys have lost several planes in the woods and the beans. <laughs> and I said, I was, I was thinking to myself, that's, have I really? But yeah, actually, I have. I, I've lost a few, so guilty have. as charged. Yeah, guilty as charged. Yep. Uh, he says, when my brother and I used to fly drones uh, in the country in the foothills, we used to use drone, uh, use a drone beeper slash finder because we flew in waist high grass and mountain mahogany. It hooks up to the board, and you connect it to your momentary switch on your transmitter. Uh, might be useful as long as you didn't eject your battery. Thanks for a great podcast, Justin. Well, thank you, Justin, for writing in. Um, we love to hear from you guys, um, and we get to hear from we get to hear from a lot of guys in Discord. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, it's always a little extra special treat when we catch an email from somebody. Um, so thank you, um, beepers. So, I'm not familiar with any beeper outside of the uh, outside of the battery tester, and I know if you let your uh, ESC sit throttled down long enough, the motor will eventually you know start buzzing the motor, mm-hmm. and that's got not a ton of volume but a little bit of volume to it. Do you know anything about these beepers and how loud they are, you or Tony? I do. Uh, at least I know the ones that are built for drones. They have like their own separate little battery. They have those little screamer horns uh, that are on like the battery beepers. And they have got like kind of a, 
it's just like one channel that they plug into or that you can solder them down onto a control board and you assign it to a switch and then when you hit the switch it you know it screams now some of them don't have a battery some of them do um the ones have a battery that uh i think it's like if it loses voltage and it's pulling from internal batteries it'll immediately start screaming because it's assuming you lost a battery um yeah so do you like set a uh start, set one of your channels high and he, if it loses if the ese loses power and the receiver dies and the channel goes low and it knows to yeah then it knows to get off. internal battery basically use internal battery um to to start screaming i guess uh, there's a couple different ones like that um they almost all seem to to me require like a direct hookup to a flight board and most of my planes don't have a flight board i don't know tony maybe you know a little bit different um i always lose my battery so Every time I think, oh, it'll be cool, and then like that's the time when I lose that plane, I lose the battery, I lose all power. There's, it doesn't matter where, and and then if there's a battery checker on it, even if I could find the bat, like nope, that battery checker flew off too. So, <laughs> I mean, there's there's no hope for me to ever find my planes when they go down in that manner. Uh, yeah, Tony, I, do you know I have about it? I have zero knowledge or experience with any of the beepers. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've got a couple of those low voltage beepers that you plug into the balance port. Mm -hmm. I've never used them. There's a bunch of guys in our local club that, you, that use them and swear by them. I got them as part of a collection of stuff when somebody yeah. gave me a box, but yeah, I've, I've never really used them and don't really, okay. can't really talk to it at all. Well, maybe we'll, uh, may, I should look into it for sure. Cause I, <laughs> I keep losing stuff in the fields. I mean, the grass gets awful tall, awful quick, and it get now gets difficult to find things. Yeah. Now this is something. Um, rearranging my screens here so I can see mm -hmm. you guys while I'm looking at this. Um, so I just did a quick check on RC locator beeper. And I'm not sure if this is specifically what he's talking about. Uh, but I found a lost alarm finder buzzer airplane finder for RC tracker tracer hub Shrama, uh, or something, um, off eBay. So whatever, but just the concept, uh, like a buck 50 each, but it's, it's like it is a servo. So it's like a servo extender cause it's got servo leads, male and female. And then, yeah, it's like a, uh, almost like a little, uh, Pi piezo speaker but yeah, yeah the, yeah, the, the, the bell horn like the uh like the battery tester mm -hmm. um i'm trying to see if it has a description it says connect the alarm between the servo and the receiver i.e it acts as a servo extension cord turn on the transmitter you'll hear two beep sound do not move any of the control stick on the TX or simply turn off the TX. You will hear a continuous beep sound after one minute. It will stop once you turn your TX or move the control stick. Uh, if you ignore the continuous beep for around two minutes, the beep sound will change to a louder V sound. So okay, like this whoop, one... Whoop. At, okay. Maybe. This one at least... Uh, is plugging in like in line with whatever servos uh or whatever you're you know coming off the receiver with so it's like a, a servo lead extender but it's got uh it's got that i almost wonder if you shouldn't put that on like the uh the throttle channel or maybe like a um i guess perhaps your elevator channel since your elevator, you tend to use a fair bit. I was going to say, I wonder not, if it's reading the the pulse, the control pulse that goes to that servo, and that's what it's using to detect that you're you're still actively using the system. Mm-hmm. Because it definitely says. Uh, in which case, I guess you could take it to the ESC. But it's well, you probably want it coming off the ES, not coming from the ESC because the ESC is powering the board. Anyway. Um, but yeah, if it's not detecting anything for a while, then it goes off. Now, what, uh, Justin, yes, what Justin was talking about was, you know, having one on a channel that has a momentary switch. So his was being manually activated. Mm -hmm. This one seems like, 
uh, maybe what's a little more ideal, which is if you lose signal or you lose the plane, you just right. shut the transmitter off. And again, so long as power, then after a minute, it's going to start going off. So there seems to be a couple different variations on this. Yeah, there are. And um, again, there are some with like a 150 milliamp battery that's attached to the board itself and shrink wrapped to it. So that mm -hmm. way, even if it ejects, <laughs> it has power. You just have to remember yet another thing to charge before you go. But other than that, I mean, if you rely on that, that's going to be pretty helpful. Yeah. Um, at least the seller on eBay seems to have a decent rep, and these are reasonably priced. I'd be curious to see what uh, what a non-eBay price is. Yeah, I don't know. Do, do me a favor and put the link to it in the show notes so we could look at it real quick. Um, and maybe others want to take a look. Again, this is not an endorsement or anything. We don't know other, anything other than, hey, this might be a solution for you. Like, it might be a solution for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or me specifically, because I keep throwing my stuff into the into the unknown. Oh, my God. Anyway. <laughs> so At least you're not walking through a cornfield. Um, some days, uh, I am, <clears throat> it depends on what time of year and which field I'm going towards. Yeah. Cor corn is pretty rough. It's pretty rough going though. Is that what you fly at almost every time? Um, not like, currently, not currently. Um, I'm lucky now that we have, we do have some corn nearby, but it's not adjacent to the field. Um, or at least not adjacent to the, the cut area. Um, growing up though, when I was early on in the hobby, our, our flying field was literally dead center in a farm field. And we would have corn along two edges of the runway with soybeans along the other two. Mm -hmm. So yeah, anytime you lost an airplane, it was, it was always a fun adventure trying to find it. <laughs> yeah. That's where uh, I taught my son the, the reason for always having somebody with you if you can even if it's just to be a spotter you know because they're the person who can catch you on the line and that that's kind of what I was bummed about is that I was hoping that I could act as a spotter for Amy so when she lost it I could keep her online and then she could go oh, I've actually found my thing I didn't think I never would you know because it makes a big difference in the chance that you're going to make it back with a plane you know Unless, I guess, if you have one of these beepers, right? Okay. Um, before we uh, chatter the entire night away forever and ever. Um, oh, that's right. You want to talk a little bit about the FTCA. Yeah, let me talk about a little bit of, I'll call it uh, regulatory news for the FAA or regarding um, FAA regulations. The FTCA and the... FPV Freedom Coalition um, are two of three current recognized CBOs or community-based organizations, people recognized by the FAA to allow designation of FRIAs. It turns out that as the FTCA and the Freedom FPV Freedom Coalition talk to the FAA, the FAA has no desire to put thousands of uh, FRIAs around, uh, or I ca call it tens of thousands of FRIAs around wherever we would fly. They just plan on, you know, uh, getting about 4,000 of the ones from the AMA, plus maybe a couple places that the FPV Freedom Coalition designates, and then maybe the three or four fields that uh, Flight Test wants, right? And it seems like that tends to be the trend that those guys are seeing, right? And they're like, well, this is awful. And they say, you know, we still encourage you to put in your, your flying uh, FRIA location so that we can get those in and try to get them approved, right? But one of the other strategies is the FAA has a reauthorization act every, I don't know how many how many years, but it's pretty frequently. And basically the government basically says, yeah, here's your mandate for the next year. Here's your funding to do this. And it's a list of things that they need to go do or change, right? Um, and so what they want you to do is go and talk to your Congress people and your senators and implore them as representatives of you and as you being a part of their constituency um, where you live. If you live in multiple spots, you can go and request that. Like there's a guy who's like, I live in Texas and, you know, Tennessee. And I, I reached out to both of them already, you know. Uh, and it's basically, you know, writing them. There's a, They give you a form letter 
um, to basically go into their, um, I'll call it the complaint department, or basically issue notification saying, hey, I live in your thing. This is what I want. And it kind of talks to them about the request is to change the bottom limit of the requirement for a remote ID unit from 250 grams, which is based on some French artillery thing from the from the 1880s or whatever the history is there. I didn't look into it as much as I wanted. Um, and saying, you know, let's, let's actually use science. And I, it, it turns out that more like a kilogram is probably where you start doing genuine damage um, to people and, and buildings and places and things like that, where you could really do some harm to that and an aircraft, you know, full scale aircraft, all that kind of stuff. So I said, why don't we change the bottom limit from 250 grams to one kilogram and allows basically what that does is it frees up a lot of park flyers. Um, a lot of people trying to get into the hobby He goes, that way you're not hamstringing the aviation industry. You're not hamstringing the hobby. Once you're past that park level and you're starting to do bigger, more serious projects, then you know you love it. You know you're interested, and you're you're probably more willing to get a get a remote ID unit so that you could do the hobby legally if it's not at a Fria, you know, and that kind of stuff, and follow the regulations as need, right? So that is their recommendation. XJet, in his expertise or in his experience, I should say, um, this is Bruce Simpson. He's over in New Zealand, but he follows world uh, I'll call it world politics regarding. Um, the model aviation industry. And he's looking at, you know, uh, England and America because they tend to be the trendsetters uh, for the rest of the world. And so he's like, hey, um, what you need to do here, he goes, I've had a lot of experience trying to change things from within and getting our politicians to hear us and sending form letters while that works. What they do is they hear the one letter and they they mark, make a mark, and they get another thousand. They keep making marks. They go, hey, this letter here, I got a thousand of them. He didn't have to read it a thousand times, but it didn't take his, he's always one of those form letters. Cool, we'll just put it in there, right? And he just marked down how many. It's like, oh, there's a lot of people. Maybe we should do something about it, right? He's like, well, that's go ahead and do that if, if that's all you have time to do. But what I urge you to do is take the points of this letter, write your own letter, and at the end of it, I think, how does he put it? He says, basically, give them a call to action. Say, I would like to hear your response or I would like to hear your uh, opinions on this matter, right? Or on these items. You know, please, please let me know your thoughts on this. So it forces them to, one, read it because it's not a form letter. Two, it forces them to have somebody go in and actually formulate a reply. And that takes resources. And the more resources you make them use, the more likely they are to look at you and go, how do we get these people to go away? <laughs> and ultimately, is it, oh, well, we just got to make this change. This change really doesn't seem, it seems pretty innocuous, right? And so what I see is because the FAA didn't do this to the hobby per se, right? It was government. Congress mandating that the FAA do the following and the man, you know, FAA did what they did. Right. So it seems like, well, if, if we can't just say, Hey, FAA, please stop doing this. It's like, well, we didn't do it. So go to the people who did talk to your congressman, talk to your statesmen, uh, your senators. That's, I, I use congressmen and Congress could be women. I don't know. Not trying to be sexist, just Congress person. Congress person. These are the people I grew, uh, I don't know, the terms I grew up with. So shame on my 80s language. Um, all right. Well, the point is, is that is a real, those two videos are really good to watch. Take this and sh share it around to people who have interest in the RC hobby. Maybe they're not RC hobbyists. They're not enthusiasts like we are, but maybe they're, they love that you love it. And it's like, well, I'm about to lose that, Right. And if you like to fly on airplanes and you don't want to wait, um, I don't know, two hours for a new fresh pilot to, to come show up on your plane to fly the plane, you might, you might want to help um, something like this go through so that we continue to have people who are interested in the hobby, interested in aviation, have a desire to become a pilot and go through all the hurdles that it takes to get there. Because there's, there's a long path to get to be a, a pilot. It's a cool perk. You definitely get to drive the cool bus, but 
<laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, it's not for everybody. You have to have a passion for it to really make it all the way through, I think. So if you are hamstringing the little leagues, uh, the likelihood that you're going to have a flourishing uh, pro league is pretty minimal in my estimation. So anyway, this seems like a good path. I wanted everybody to hear about it. I wanted everybody to know about it. Look for the links. Uh, again, look for FT, FTCA. The video is called, let's see, let me... The video is called, um, let's see, Call to Action for Remote uh, remote ID. We need your help. And it's by Flight Test Community Association channel. And then XJet has one called US Drone and RC Plane Enthusiasts. You need to act now. So go look those up. Watch them. They're, you know, 10 minutes each maybe. Um, the, the links to the form letter are through the FP, FPV Freedom Coalition. Um, they have a link in the, the description um, to go and get your letter, letter and start start from there. Um, I urge you to go do it. Uh, the deadline for that is coming up in, a, I think, a month or so, uh, where they're going to have to start reviewing the FAA uh, renewal. Um, okay. Reauthorization. So this is the time to get them to notice it, to be able to bring it in and, and change what they're authorizing. Okay. All right. Yep. I want to make sure everybody knows that, about that before it gets too far down the path and we forget it even existed. I'll remind you next time though. Well, thank you for that. Yep. So, um, talking about what, jet generations now yeah yeah well I, what i realized is i don't know anything about jets i mean i mean really not a whole lot except they go fast and they're really cool and they make a whooshy noise wow <laughs> <laughs> no not quite like that no and then there's been a lot of talk in the news in the last couple um uh, last couple months about new gen you know gen sixth gen this and fifth gen fighter and fourth gen that like what it what's what is that? What is the difference between it, right? Um, I know the United States is, you know, basically limited its fighter jets to only a handful of types, but they are variable. Like they all have, um, they're pretty pretty versatile aircraft to be able to tackle a lot of different things, not just kind of one that fits it all, right? Right. Um, so uh, anyway, let's let's get into that. So. The, the first generation is pretty straightforward. It's when jet propulsion happened. It's at the end of World War uh, II. Um, I'm trying to... Re- Tony, do you remember the name of the aircraft? I'm blanking on it right now. What's uh, that? We, I think we, we cover the history of the first jet aircraft that was in the World War II. Well, the first one that... I I think the first one that saw combat was the, the Messerschmitt 262. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the, the giant firecracker. <laughs> well, that would be the twin, the twin jet on with swept wings. Okay. Um, I know there yeah, were some that flew prior to that. I think the first one that flew was the British Whittle jet. Okay. Very cool. So, so that was the beginning of the jet age, right? That's the first gen, right? And then they started realizing that they needed to do a little bit more um, to be able to. Um, continue to be successful and outwit the previous generation of this plane is faster than yours. And so they added, uh, they swept the wings, which increases, uh, it decreases drag, increases speed, uh, the range finding radar. So it allows them to kind of detect enemies um, from in the air and then infrared guided missiles, which were effectively uh, heat seeking missiles. Um, So that kind of changed the way combat happened. Now, if you had to basically point and shoot and somebody got to just point and forget, more or less, um, it, it changes the way warfare happens for sure in the sky. Uh, third generation. And this is kind of, this is how the Air Force kind of broke down what the capabilities were. Um, you know, there's a couple of different sites. They all kind of vary a little bit about the limits of what these generations are because they're not entirely well-defined, but I think this is probably the most common accepted boundary, maybe. Um, supersonic flight. So third generation, they got to supersonic flight. 
so faster than the speed of sound. Um, they had pulse radar. They had missiles that can engage opponents from beyond visual range. So basically, you don't even have to see your enemy. As long as you can see it on the radar, you can launch your missile and forget it. Hmm. That changes the way combat happens for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's why it's like, oh, this is a whole new generation of craft. This is different. We don't we don't even stand a chance, right? Like, this, this is going to be tough. Um, then you look at fourth gen. Uh, fourth gen, and then they, they actually, because fourth gen has been kind of around, and it's also one of the latest generations, it's kind of defined in minor steps as well, like four, four plus, four plus plus. It's like, oh, these are... Mine's better than yours a little bit. Um, so it, they basically are planes that have high level agility. They have some degree of sensor fusion um, where they're basically pulling sensor suites together in a kind of comprehensive, a better comprehensive picture. Pull stopler radar, reduced radar signature. So they have some sort of kind of minor stealth capability. They, f- they fly by wire, which means um, you are no longer, as I understand, you are no longer... Um, pushing a stick that moves cables that change your surface angles, right? For your control surfaces. You are now saying, hey, plane, I want to go here. It's input, it's taking inputs from other external sources, mixing them in, and then inputting, move the aileron this much to do what this guy wants us to do based on all the given parameters. Mm -hmm. And so you're not directly flying the plane anymore. You are now flying by wire. You are letting the computer mix inputs in. And it's kind of like what we do um, with flight sta- flight stabilizers. Right? Sure. That's essentially a fly by wire. Because you are not directly controlling the aileron. You're not controlling the servo that controls that. You are telling it, I want to go left. And it's saying there's also a strong wind to the right. So we're going to actually add more input so you can do the proper roll. And it, okay. and you're so you're not controlling the thing. You are controlling one of the inputs that the flight controller uses to control the airplane, right? And then uh, and again, if you if you uh, have better information on this, Tony, if I'm getting it egregiously wrong, please uh, either of you guys let me know. Uh, let's see. And then it's a look down, shoot down missiles. I'm not quite sure what that means, except that you launch them and you can actually look from the missile as it goes down to your enemy and you can watch and target it as it goes. And when hmm. you, when you look at, um, the latest, uh, uh, my gosh, the latest Top Gun movie when they're firing Still into the box. Seen it. Oh my, that's right. You only got a part of the way in. Oh, David. <laughs> oh. When they paint the box, they launch a missile and there's one guy's responsibility is to continue to paint the box to basically make sure that the missile is still continuing to aim at the target all the way till it hits the target. And he's got a first person, first missile view all, okay. all the way to contact. Right. And of course there's other, there's other features, right. But those are the ones that kind of like set that apart from the previous generation. And some of it is an extension of what went before. Some of it is, Oh yeah, this, this changes thing. Now I don't know the difference between, <coughs> pardon me, pulse radar and Pulse Doppler radar. I don't know the difference. I'm assuming it's better range and better clarity. Uh, I'm trying to find that in your system. Pulse Doppler. Um, yeah. Yeah. When it comes, like, I get it when it comes to weather stuff because that's, as I remember, if I remember correctly, the whole thing about Doppler was like two positions emitting a radar and like reading from each other. So I'm not sure how that would play in with an aircraft Mm -hmm. unless they were getting communicating like with each other. Right. Like there's two, two radar sources from different aircraft or different sources, like from a ship and from the plane. And then they both get feedback and it creates a better, more accurate picture and they work those fusion together. And then there's what, you keep exploring that thought, but before we lie to people, I'm going to look, it up. <laughs> well, no, look, look it up. We just are being ignorant at people. That's all. It's not a lie. <laughs> all right. Well, let me let me move on to fifth gen, right? And that that's like the the current. We'll call it the current state of the art 
as it stands. And then we'll move into what does sixth gen look like, right? Um, fifth gen, let's see, uh, they have stealth capability, which means that they are hiding their uh, detection signature, usually in one of the radar um, signatures, there's like a high frequency and a low frequency. And the low frequency is still detects the planes, but it's not as accurate. I think the high frequency is what's on most of the aircraft. Um, and that is what the stealth stuff uh, defeats. And so by the time they get enough clarity in the low frequency, the plane is already somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's still not as effective, but they, but they, they can detect that you're there with the low frequency, but the high frequency can tell you exactly where you're at and use it for targeting. I think is uh, the difference between the two. And then the stealth technology currently works to defeat the high, um, the high frequency, I think. Um, otherwise I have it exactly backwards. Um, but I think it's high frequency is it what it defeats. And then there's a, there's also a high degree of maneuverability. Um, and that, that's kind of built into, it's not like we had a plane and we threw stealth at it. Like these planes are designed with stealth in mind, right? They're part of the design process. Advanced avionics systems, which is kind of like fly-by-wire, but even more so. Um, morphing wing sections, things like that, are some ideas that have been toyed with. Um, <clears throat> they're also using, um, let's see, they have multi-role capabilities, uh, so they can do more than one thing. They, don't, they aren't just um, a fighter. They're not just a bomber. They're not just a reconnaissance. They do a little bit of everything. Um, and then they also use networked or data fusion capabilities. So they get an, uh, data sources from um, uh, your side and use that to create a better target picture or a better theater picture for you in the pilot, uh, in, the, in mm -hmm. the pilot seat, right? And I know, if I recall right, the F-35s, Bs or A, they actually have done away with the HUD and they, they have an in-visor, in-helmet HUD system. Yes. And it actually pulls all that data from other, and then by data fusion, it's basically saying like you can target stuff in advance ahead of you, but you send, you don't have the missiles capable to fire at that, but there is a ship that has that. It'll use your radar signature and fuse it with their information and use that to launch the long, long range missile at the target you see and that you pay. So what, so what they've gotten into and I, and, I'm not going to let this turn into the F-35 history segment, but I did watch <laughs> well, we'll get to that later a video on the F-35 mm -hmm. and the, it, it, the, the engineering that went in behind the stealth and specifically it's radar. Um, like there was a lot of things that went into its radar system, but uh, the F-35 is capable of operating uh, as I understand, like a hive mind uh, unit. Mm -hmm. And so, when when there's multiple F-35s flying together, um, they their planes, like the systems on board, automatically are relaying information constantly back and forth among each other. And so if one has a radar lock on a plane that's under you, so you're in, a, you're in the lead 35, somebody's trailing a way back, and you've got a bogey under you, your radar can't pick it up but your wingman can, from his position, that information is relayed to your plane. And you see it. <laughs> as though it was picked up by your systems. And actually, that, that HUD you're talking about mm -hmm. is reminiscent of or is similar to Microsoft HoloLens technology, uh -huh. where when they roll their head around, the HUD relays information based on where they're looking. So they can look like down and see the target beneath them. Mm -hmm. that their buddy's got a radar lock on. Here, I thought it was like so, Iron Man. I know, right? What's that? <laughs> yeah. I said, here, I was picturing something like Iron Man, Jarvis technology. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's not So to hear that they're piggybacking off of, you know, warship targets or warships are piggybacking off their targets, yeah, I can absolutely see it. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, the small list of... Uh, what is it? as of January 2023, the combat ready fifth generation fighters are pretty limited. They are the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor, which entered service in the United States Air Force in December 2005. This is, I think, from Wikipedia. 
uh, Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II, which entered service in the Air Force, United States Air Force in July 2015. The uh, Chengdu uh, J2, uh, J-20, which entered uh, service into the People's Liberation Army Air Force, which is uh, China in September 2017. And then the Sukhoi Su-57, which entered service in the Russian Air Force VV, VVS in uh, on Christmas Day in 2000, uh, and, uh, 2020, so December 25th, 2020. Um, and then I went to a different website that had uh, like 16 current aircraft that are either at least in the works as fifth gen aircraft or, um, or functioning. Let's see. I think they're all set as they're, no, some of them are like 2026. And so 2020, so there's some, um, projects on the wing for sure. Um, see, there's a, did I, did, I think I've messed it up. Um, I, I won't even worry about it, but go, go to, um, military, militaryfactory.com and then look up fifth generation fighter aircraft. They have a list. My, my, um, my screen grab, grabbed the wrong set, I guess. So yeah. That's, I was wondering why it was posted it or pasted in here. Yeah. Twice. It looks like it was in there twice. I have those as well, but it includes stuff like, um, uh, let's see the Sequoia checkmate SU 75, which is due in 2026. And then the Thai, uh, T I T A I T F dash X, which is a fifth gen fighter. And that is, I don't I think that's India I'm looking at the flag. It's not one I recognize. Um, Anyway, so uh, go look those up, and then let's talk about the 6th Gen real quick. 6th uh, Gen is what everybody keeps saying. Oh, we're at the next 6th Gen. What, what are they going to have, right? So a lot of people say that it's going to be a modular design. So basically one plane frame will be able to do a lot of different things. They'll be able to swap out uh, core components quicker and easier so they can update the models um, for current technologies quicker with less mm -hmm. effort and money. Um, they are optionally manned, as in AIs will replace them. Um, if you are not of my era, Macross Plus is a an anime that specifically um, addresses this kind of thought process of, is that something we want to do? Um, then, there, of course, they uh, also will have... Does Terminator not answer enough? <sighs> Apparently not. You know, not quite. Um, Drone Swarm. Space Odyssey 2000? Still no, no, no. Hal's still totally fine. Thanks. Don't worry about it. <laughs> iRobot? We we could go on for days with that. Okay. <laughs> so many movies. <laughs> uh, but that was one where it's specifically AI controlled aircraft versus piloted aircraft. Okay. Um, and then so another one is these will oftentimes have drone, uh, drone swarm loyal wingmen. So you will not just be piloting your sixth gen aircraft. You will be piloting a swarm. Um, like four or five wingman uh, uh, drones that will then accompany you in your flight and you control. As part right, that's of pretty your, dope. It is pretty dope. You also have complete data uh, fusion and integration in your heads-up display, which will be in your helmet, like you talked about, and it'll probably be even more so. Uh, these planes will have a power surplus because they'll probably have some sort of laser, laser firepower or, or for stuff that we don't even know about, right? like stuff that's being created as we currently talk, right? Um, also, they will have longer weapon ranges than ever before. Um, and I, I was going to quote uh, one of my favorite uh, sci-fi groups where there's, it's a Knight's Dawn trilogy by Peter of Hamilton. And basically the battles are controlled by AIs because humans don't think fast enough. These planes are going at like Mach 20 and all the things happen within a millisecond. So basically they start a combat and within... Less than a half a minute, the whole thing's done one way or another. And one Oof. side has obliterated the other or vice versa, right? And it's all, it's basically you kind of set out what you want and hope it works and hit the button. And that's, that's what's happening. Um, now granted, some of the stuff is in space. So, you know, um, those kind of speeds don't really, anyway. Um, there's also IR holograms for target foibles. So we're a lot of those uh, IR tracking signals are basically looking for heat signatures, right? And so what you're doing is creating like a um, uh, heat, a fake plasma heat signature that is actually outside of your aircraft for the missile to target because it's a hotter target and using yeah. lasers and plasma to, to help kind of create a holographic location of where that is. So it, 
and that would be a next gen thing, like where you're just like, oh, I can't even battle. <laughs> I can't even send my missiles at it. It won't do anything at all because it's not targeting the plane anymore. It's targeting the holographic spot. So, well, it's just uh, new age chaff and flare, more or less. Yeah, but it's still, um, it would change one side's ability to affect the other significantly, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway. So that's sixth gen. Uh, I don't know, Tony. You know anything new? Uh, anything what they're saying sixth gen should include that I didn't cover? Balloons. <laughs> China has been making good use of them. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, that's true. No, I, mean, I, they... I don't. I don't have a lot of knowledge on <laughs> on that type of stuff. I'm not the modern the modern jets, and that just isn't my my interest. So. That's fine. Well, then let's let's get to talking to you, Tony, and get to meet. Like, how did everybody get a chance to meet you? Um, we're yeah. We just real quick in the future, we may need to move the guest segment more towards the beginning of the episode. We can do we that. Ramble. Wait, it's all what? good. We do. Yes, yes, we do. But go ahead. That's I've been okay. just sitting here talking over airplane designs with Spawn, so. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, I saw you over there texting away. <laughs> yeah, we want, we're, like, we see you. I'm like, yeah, we, we're bored <laughs> now. <laughs> no, no, we're just, we're having a good conversation. There's some good stuff in the works. Yeah, I'm looking forward nice. to catching up with that. Um, okay, so tell us about, like, how long ago did you get started in a hobby? What, oh, what's boy. your origin story? So... Uh, it goes way back. My, I, I'm considerably younger than my siblings and my dad and my brother got into it when I was just two years old. So I've been around the hobby my whole life. Um, now back then this was the eighties. So nitro airplanes, everything had to be built, you know, running, mm -hmm. Uh, the first radio systems they had were right as the AMA was mandating the switch to narrow band frequencies on 72 megahertz. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, this this is going way back. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of was just... Tech? A, yeah, yeah. So, I, I was just always around it. Um, growing up always with a magazine in my hand, always had an interest in airplanes in general and, and having access to the models like that, I just always wanted to do it. Um, when I was eight years old, my dad changed jobs and the company he went to work for had a very active group of flyers. Um, he had kind of gotten out of it. My brother had gone away to college and he did it mainly as a, a thing to do with him and had kind of gotten, ha, had given up on it a little bit. I, I, maybe not given up, just had lost the interest in it. Mm -hmm. um, so having these guys at work that were active in it, I was kind of getting to an age where I could start to participate in it. And he went out to to see these guys fly, and and seeing that avenue of the hobby they were in, he immediately, like he told my mom right away, saying, "Next week when they go, Tony's got to come." <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're growing up. We we had a small club. A lot of guys flew gliders, and you know, guys were flying cadets and sport models and things like that this new group of guys were flying giant scale warbirds and big gassers and flying combat on a weekly basis and doing things that we had never really had, you know, access to or seen before other than what we were reading in the magazines. So hmm, by yeah. that, I, I really had a, a, a blessed upbringing in the hobby because I, I was able to be surrounded by some just incredible modelers. But that's also where my background in balsa building and scratch building and scale modeling came from. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as we mentioned in other topics before, everything kind of ebbs and flows and, and things get good and things get, you know, peter out or plateau and fizzle out. And 
and that group did the same. Um, I had an opportunity to build some amazing airplanes. I got to go to a lot of events with them, but then they started having troubles with their field. Some of the guys that wanted to do bigger and better airplanes needed a better flying site than what the club had. And, Mm -hmm. you know, guys were starting to get older in age and were finding different interests, things like that. And the group we were flying with kind of just dissolved for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, So then I was kind of having to find my own path in the hobby and still had a lot, a strong interest in scale modeling and building and things like that. And I started to, to do more design work and get involved in a little bit more of that side. And, and then eventually started going after some of the, the planes from back in my earlier, you know, memories okay. that I had never had an opportunity to build. Um, you know, yeah. When you're with a group of guys that are doing a set type of airplane, you tend to do the group, you know, as much as mm-hmm. I wanted to build, you know, for example, a GB is one of my absolutely favorite airplanes, but nobody was doing race airplanes. Everybody was doing warbirds and it was as fun as a GB could be. It was a, a lot more fun to have a Mustang or something like that to fly with the group because the group activity was more fun. Um, same is true with all the, the non-scale airplanes. So the last several years I've been spending time or, or targeting the projects that I passed up on building a lot of these nostalgic retro yeah. type airplanes. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, when you're like, Hey, you know, I never did, I always enjoyed this, but I never got to get yeah. a chance to get into it. So you know, like, you know, I don't know, let's say you're, as a kid, you're like me, you had a transformer. You're like, oh, I wish I had those transformers. And you're like, I'm older now. I can actually go do that. <laughs> I, I get to make my choices now. Uh, and not that you didn't back then, but like you said, you, know, you were with a group of guys that did a thing. And it's way more yeah. fun to have and those I had builds amazing, ready. amazing, amazing opportunities. I got to go to a lot of big events. Um, I got to meet, I mean, I got to meet and fly with guys that I remember reading about in magazines when I was a kid. And as you, an adult, I got think... to fly alongside them, you know. So Yeah, nice. So who, um, a couple names or a couple events that you can um, think of? Well, I I got down to Joe Nall. I got mm-hmm. to um, the Dogs event in Dayton was a big one at Wright-Patterson. Uh, okay. Didn't fly at, but was able to attend the Dawn Patrol Rendezvous, which is a World War One event. Mm-hmm. Um, Nice. Then the advent, the group I was traveling with or was kind of part of, um, ultimately, they were the ones that created what's called the Warbird Alliance, uh, which is a a group up here in the Midwest region that hosts a a bunch of large Warbird-themed events. Um, So I got to kind of see the birth of those events and and watch all that come to be too which was a very interesting learning curve yeah definitely um was there um i mean it sounds like the way you got into the hobby was that you it just was surrounding you was there any one memory that you remember like this is what hooked you i mean besides watching your family like okay we're going to do this thing but was there one you're like oh yeah that i'm in i want to do that yeah there is um, so again, growing up watching the guys flying sport models and gliders and things, it was cool. I always knew I wanted to do it, but there were a lot of other things in life that would steal that interest. Mm-hmm. I still remember the first time walking or arriving to the field down in, in Beaver Dam, which was the, the, you know, the new club that we were going to be part of. Okay. And as I pull up. I am watching these guys fire up the engine. One of the guys had built a model of the Lockheed Electra, which would be the the twin engine airplane that Amelia Earhart was flying in her final flight. Oh, okay. 100 plus inch wingspan, two gasoline engines. Wow. Finish finished in polished metal, 
gorgeous airplane. I mean, and he was, I mean, the airplane was featured in a magazine. Um, it just, un, you know, I had never seen anything like that before. And yeah, we pulled up and I see him and him and another guy that those two guys actually, you know, came to be very important mentors in my life. But they were firing up the engines and I remember him, you know, one of the guys grabbing the airplane like a bear hug and picking it up and lifting it up to test the engines. And I'm going, oh, my God. I mean, this thing is huge. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that before. And then yeah. watching him go out and fly that and that that moment there was i said okay that's nice. that's what i want to do i don't want to do you know just the the little toy airplanes i want to do real miniature airplanes right so you want to basically giant is that super giant scale or is that not anymore oh. <laughs> it was back then um, <laughs> yeah i mean that was. that was on the cutting edge of what you know you could do size wise realistically back then um, right, like that's like third or quarter scale, or like right. closing it on half, depending on the plane. Right. Right. Nowadays, it's you go to some of these warbird events, and that airplane would be considered small. Right. Oh, I know. I, I mean, looking around, like some of the things, I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. How do? <laughs> I don't know. I just I look at. It, I just wonder. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder what they do, where they have enough time to do build one of those. Yeah, that same guy, the last airplane he built spanned 190 inches, I think. 190? Yeah. Wow. That's a full-scale aircraft. I'm just saying. Yeah, that, yeah. that's that's healthy. It was 100, and, I think it's it's either 180 or 190 inch A26 Invader. I mean, it's, oh, it's yeah. huge. You know, you guys yeah. covered the B36 months ago. Yeah. <laughs> he built one that's, I think that. Did we? The B36 Peacemaker. Yeah, the, the big nu uh, nuclear bomber. Yeah, Joe, you that sounds so familiar. That's because yeah. you covered six, it. <laughs> six push. Oh, did I? <laughs> six pusher engines. Right, and jets. that was the eight engine. Got it. Oh yeah. Well, he's got one of those. That, Shut up, Matt. He's got one of those that spans like two hundred and some inches. It, Holy cow! Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Just, yeah. So that so, that was that was my upbringing. That was the world mm -hmm. I grew up in. Is seeing these guys building these giant airplanes like that and, and doing just incredible projects. and Right. So, so what, it sounds like what you've grown up doing was like balsa and, um, composites, you know, fiberglassing and things like that. Right. Yes. Is that, is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So how long ago did you, okay. Cause so, so we're the new group. I mean, not really, but, and we start, we try to urge people to start in foam because it's forgiving, quick, and repairable, like easy to repair. You didn't do a whole lot with foam. Not that you didn't know about it. Obviously, people have been working with like pink foam and blue foam for a while, right? Yeah, um, and foam goes way back. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, there were, was, I think, when like foam core wings became real popular in the aerobatic mm -hmm. side of things, but... Um, yeah, you yeah really it's always kind of wire. been around, but I, it hasn't been the go-to material that it is now. Yeah. So can you tell us what you're, I, I'm curious. So I'm curious because we kind of urge you like, no, 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 you should really try try this Dollar Tree foam board thing. If I recall right, we you were with us on one of the build nights. Was that the first time you built with Dollar Tree foam? What were you building? Yeah, one of them. I my first flight test design that I tried to build was a simple scout. Um, I had dabbled with foam a little bit in the past. I had done a couple of the fan fold or blue foam type airplanes. Mm -hmm. Um, I had done it. There was a an airplane years ago that was sold called the Mud Duck. Mm -hmm. Um, that was built out of essentially foam board. I had I had had one of those. So, I mean. I had seen planes built with it, but I didn't have a lot of firsthand knowledge of it. And mm -hmm. at the time, which would have been right around 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. um, I started getting interested in doing foam. There was a lot of chatter on the forums and community groups about the AMA clubs becoming the stuffy old man groups and you know, all you hear from those guys is that nobody builds anymore. And there was a lot of negativity, I guess, around building airplanes. And 
I started to explore foam a little bit more and I found some amazing builds online mm-hmm. that really kind of opened my eyes to what could be possible with foam and it piqued my curiosity. Um, yeah. Now, like everything else I do in life, it, it would be years before I got to a foam build because I had <laughs> such a I know. backlog of projects. So, yeah. yeah. Um, fast forward about 2019 or so, 2020, getting into that time frame. Mm-hmm. And I s- started listening to a couple podcasts and, and I started hearing a little bit more and more about the flight test community. And I had heard of Flight Fest, or not a Flight Fest, a Flight Test, and I knew of their YouTube channel. And I admittedly, like a lot of guys in the Balsa world, they were the ones doing the goofy videos with the cheap foam board airplanes. And I I didn't take it very seriously. But I also didn't know that they had the community that they did. So... I started hearing more about Flight Test, and then I heard some stories about people going to Flight Fest, which I hadn't even known about. Mm-hmm. And I went, there's more to this than I realize, and I'm not being a good advocate for the hobby as a whole if I don't know about this side of the hobby. Yeah. So I started to dig in and do more research, and that's when I found you guys, and that's when I found um like the RC we're sorry by lab the way and <laughs> no no absolutely not <laughs> no, and kidding. when i started to to look at the flight test forums and that and i realized that there are a whole lot of guys building that don't get seen by the balsa world side of the hobby no not at all and there's a lot of guys on like the flight test forums that are they live and breathe the flight test world and there's not a lot of crossover between the two. Yeah. And I'll, I'll admit I, I'm pretty guilty of that. Well, I was guilty and just the opposite too. Yeah. And then I said, okay, I got to try one of these. And that's when I got the, the idea that I'm going to pick one of the flight test designs and just try building it. And yeah, that first night, um, in one of your build parties, I sat down with a hot glue gun and some foam board, and I built the majority of us of a simple scout. Yep. I yeah, I hated how I it turned that out. Night. Yeah, I hated how it turned out. It never went anywhere <laughs> further than that because I was really disappointed with what it looked like and the quality of my work. Because again, you coming up in the balsa world you're conditioned to build perfect because you're going to spend all winter building an airplane. You, you can't, if something happens, if something's not right, it's going to take that much time to build a replacement. Yeah. So that mindset there is everything has to be perfect. And especially when you're dealing with foam board with the paper on, if you damage that surface, you have damaged that surface. It's not a balsa yeah. airplane that you can put yeah, putty you, on or fill and you can't once steam you put out. or over it, you won't tell. Like yeah. everything's right in your face. So and So what, it, what I'm hearing in all this is Joe would probably make a better balsa builder than a foam builder. Well, but there's two possible. ways to look at that too, and that's where my <laughs> journey has come up full circle so i built a couple you know ft type airplanes and i even designed one which we talked about earlier with my Mm -hmm. my crossfire design for the hang rc which looks uh, amazing by the way yeah i'm very happy with how that turned out but then now i have a knowledge base admittedly not a huge one, but I have a skill set and a knowledge base of what is possible with foam board. And I've got 20 years of experience with balsa and scratch building there. And somewhere in the middle of this, I learned CAD. I got a job in that industry. You know, you know, my truly my career as a as a CAD designer is because I wanted to draw airplane plans as a kid. So I learned <laughs> nice. I taught myself to to draw with a T-square and triangles because I wanted to draw airplane plans. And mm-hmm. that just nice. rolled into the next thing, into the next thing, and I got interested in, in into architecture, and that's how I ended up with a civil engineering degree and 
now I do structural engineering type work for um, construction. But but anyway, That's so awesome. I've got the design background. I've got the experience with balsa, and now I have this new skill set with foam. Yeah. Now I'm starting to blend all of it together, where right you can take, and this is the electro streak is actually one of my test builds to the you know for this purpose i want to build a foam airplane that doesn't necessarily look like a foam board airplane mm -hmm. not boxy and square not boxy per se. finish nice you paint it you you smooth it out you can putty on it you know it requires you to remove the paper which then you lose some of the strength of the foam board. You have to do some other design elements to bring that strength back, but it's very mm -hmm. doable. But that that's where I ended up now is there's a lot you can do with foam that I would not have guessed you could. Mm -hmm. Solely because I was so focused on the balsa side of the hobby that I never opened my eyes to it. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah, I was and, definitely curious on your take on you coming from one side and looking and using the other and how, how the difference of perspective is. Because there's a different way to work. There's a different there way is. to think about the project. Um, Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> well, and I'll say that, We have cookies. And I'll say this too. There's one build in particular that really made me question my beliefs on quote unquote balsa is better. Okay. Um tell my, us about it. My pride and joy, the the airplane that is still the top of my list of any airplane I've ever built is I built a one hundred inch wingspan uh Curtis Helldiver from plans by Jerry Bates. Okay. F fully functional Bombay, retracts, die breaks, flaps, perforated flaps, the whole gamut. I absolutely love the airplane itself. The model was awesome. Like I said, it is it is my benchmark. Right now, it is the plane okay. I'll put at the top as the best plane I've ever built. Nice. I found a guy yeah. online that was starting to build one that was using a foam, I'll say a hybrid foam type construction. And was I he like start skinning it with foam? He was building the main frame out of foam. He was still using some balsa for some reinforcements. Okay. And he did like a fiberglass shell over the foam for the fuselage and things like that. Okay. Okay. So it piqued my interest and I was watching his build with a lot of interest. And he was starting to get done with it. And he started to post messages saying he was very concerned with the finished weight and how well the airplane would fly. Now, right. not to get into the history of the Helldiver, but the full scale had a bit of a checkered past. Yeah. And I know we'll had... have to delve deep into that yeah. one later. <laughs> so, and he had concerns of the model mimicking that, which I did too when I built mine. Mm -hmm. um, but he was concerned that his model was going to be too heavy. So okay. I sent him a message and said, hey, I built the same airplane from the same set of drawings, same size. This is what mine weighed. I think you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. His finished model weighed, I think, about 26, 27 pounds. Wow. Mine weighed 42 and a half. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> That's a Th difference. Those are That's some, a 40% some big weight difference. Yeah. That's huge. Now, yeah. He used the same landing gear. The, now, mine was powered with a gasoline engine. His was electric. Oh. But he had right. two six-cell packs. He was running 12S on it. Well, you get a couple packs that big, you're getting close to the weight of a gas engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's there's a lot there that I went, wow, that that's a huge difference. And his airplane looked... As good, if not better, than mine. It had all the details, the panel lines, the rivets. It had the functioning dive brakes, the functioning flaps. Mm -hmm. Everything that mine had, his did, for 20 pounds less. And that one's 
that one was the one that really stuck out that I said, okay, I have to look at foam because yeah, maybe there is something to this foam. Something, yeah. Now, granted, if you took his airframe and put a gas engine on it, it it would tear the nose off. So it's <laughs> yeah. it's built oh, yeah. to handle an electric system, mm-hmm. but that's not anything new or unique. I mean, no. electrics have always been built different because you don't have to accommodate the the vibrations and things that you get with a a gas engine. So exactly. So, no, hearing that and also hearing the weight difference and. You know, very easily could reach back and like, oh yeah, add a boy foam board, uh, or foam in general. But I also know you listened to Ron and Tom with the RC Plane Lab, who are decidedly um, boss. <laughs> who are decidedly boss, but have been talking a lot about foam. I've noticed that in too. The August and September <laughs> episodes of last year. Um, because I am way behind, so I'm just now listening to uh, August and September of last year. Okay, and they have been talking a lot about foam lately. But, um, to their point, uh, when they're when they're heavier, um, they like there's something to the flight characteristics. So I would be curious to know if you got a chance to fly that foam version of your uh, Hell Diver. Uh, what the differences in the flight characteristics you saw were. And I would be curious too. Um, there is weight does play into how an airplane flies. Um, I took that airplane to shows where I was flying in a 20 mile an hour wind. And though it was rough, it would handle it. I don't think right. the foam model would have handled that much wind. Mm-hmm. Probably not as well now. Right. Um, yeah. So there were you know some of that you got to take that into account as well you know and for and really what it comes down to is it it's what you want in a model too if you're mm-hmm. a guy that you want to run a gas engine you like that sound especially with some of these radials and that that are out now mm-hmm. they sound so good you have to build the airplane to handle that um the foam bo- model no matter how you finish it is going to be more prone to hanger rash dings and dents things like that Mm -hmm. so it won't look perfect right well for long my my boss model didn't either especially when i cartwheeled it on the third takeoff (laughs) but (laughs) you know well now and that's matt brings matt brings up an interesting point there um he says won't look perfect at least for not long not long but mine have never looked perfect i've i've had planes that turned out looking good Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know that I have ever gotten my horizontal and vertical stabs to be parallel and perpendicular with my wings. Well, and And I think that may just be in an inherent flaw or difficulty of working with foam as opposed to balsa. There's difficulties in getting things, every, everything squared up. Yes and no. But even still, we as modelers have, we're, we're wired that everything has to be perfect. Walk up to a full-scale airplane. The panels don't line up perfect. They're not perfectly smooth, especially when you start looking at, like, the warbirds and that. You know, there's wrinkles, <laughs> subtle wrinkles <laughs> and stuff up. in the pad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but are you going to tell me their uh, their horizontal stab is five degrees off from their uh, <laughs> wings no not in that case but as far as things like hanger ash and dings and dents there are, there okay. are certainly some aspects of a full-scale airplane that are mm-hmm. um they're not perfect so your model can look a little rough and within reason and still look appropriate you know one of the the famous examples of this is how many models of warbirds with d-day stripes have you seen painted where the stripes are perfect Mm -hmm. every single one but those stripes were put on in the middle of the night with brooms (laughs) they're not close to with brooms yeah if you look at pictures from d-day those the stripes a lot of them the paint wasn't even dry when those airplanes took off 
those stripes were <laughs> really rough. They didn't mask them off. They didn't. They slapped the stripes on and sent the airplanes airborne. So to paint a model with perfect D-Day stripes, and for that matter, if you look at any of the restored Warbirds, they're all perfect too. But mm -hmm. that wasn't yeah. how they were in the war. And well, that's, I, that's an example that I hear come up a lot when people say, yeah, oh, but the model point. has to be perfect, but the full scale yeah. wasn't. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but now, now you're aspiring to the idea of it. I think. As opposed to the reality. There, there are two things that I learned, I guess, that surprised me about airplanes in general that I learned about through foam board. One was the how many holes can we put in this plane episode the flight test did and have it still fly. That, that yeah. astounded me. I mean, just straight out. And how, how off can your build be? And it still fly just fine. And I've learned, especially with working with the, uh, the Cub Scouts and making these gliders. And I'm, I mean, I've seen some like, oh, my God, that that's never going to fly right, you know? It's like, oh, it's like the boxes are not square at all. Like the wings are cockeye. There are all sorts of angles. And sure enough, you know what? Kids throw it and they fly pretty well. Yeah, especially They're really with for... light models and that, too. Airfoils mm -hmm. are another thing. A lot of people get real wound up over having perfect airfoils, but on a 30-inch model... It doesn't matter. It, not not like um, you think. If if you're doing some precision flying, yes. Um, yeah. You know, we, we battled with airfoils on some of the combat designs back in the day when we were trying to get... I say we, it was really a different guy in sure. the club, but, you know, he <laughs> tested a lot of airfoils to try to get his models to turn better, to fly better for combat. Sure. So, yes, they do matter to some extent, but if you're flying a high wing trainer, if that wing mm -hmm. is off a little bit, it it's not going to notice it. You're, the, right, you're hardly going to notice you, it. You'll even it out in the trim. Even mm -hmm. it out in the trim, or just the wind bounces them around enough you won't notice Mm -hmm. so. so let's uh let's kind of see if we can close it up because i know we're we're hitting past uh closing around the two-hour mark um yeah tony if you, you talked about uh designing a foam board plane i know you've designed others do you want to talk about any of those or would you mind sharing well, some I've of that i've got a us? couple that have gone out that have become popular um and it's funny because the ones i've had the most success with were actually airplanes i didn't draw for myself um, there was really? a guy on a forum on one of the forums that was talking about, man, I wish I could find plans for a, a Messerschmitt uh, ME410, which was their later war twin engine fighter. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was familiar with the airplane. I went, man, that's a really cool airplane. Yeah, I think that would be really popular. So I sent him a message oh, saying, hey, how? It's the how... asymmetrical one, right? Nope. Nope. 410 okay. would be single fin. Versus the twin fin. Um, yeah, but do you have like a... Oh, okay, I get it. I did. It doesn't look like there's a... Nothing. Then the cell looks funny from the angle it's at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of engine, not a lot of fuselage, but... So I sent <laughs> okay. him a message saying, Hey, you know, I don't know of any plans out there, but this is a really cool airplane. I'd be willing to draw if it falls into the size that I think would be where I'm mm -hmm. going to draw it. And he goes, Well, I'm looking at this size, which was exactly what I was thinking. So I started to work on it, and um, long story short, it, it the design spans 118 inches, I think. It's designed around 230cc wow. engines. Um, there's been three of them built now that I have seen pictures of. I know there's been more in process um, that I nice. either didn't get finished or I just never saw pictures from. I, I know sure. I, sent, I mailed out a number of set of plans, um, mm -hmm. and things kind of got in the way too like it has a very unique spinner shape and the source for the spinner we had went away so that that it, becomes a hiccup then too but, it's a more uh bulbous yeah it actually spinner. matches the the late model me 109s okay um, but yeah so that one's been real popular and there's been a couple built um that turned out just incredible uh, these guys mm -hmm. are doing bang up jobs on it so that one that one's kind of my, again, my, my shining star and as far nice. as designs. Um, <laughs> cool. The Crossfire took, won the, the HRC 
yep. contest for the foam board design. Um, I still, so I want to build one of those for sure. Yeah. I, you and me both, I need to put one back in my, I got rid of all my prototypes when I was making updates and I got to put a new one in my inventory, you know? Um, so yeah, that one was, that one's another one that I'm very proud of, mm -hmm. um, which again is funny because on one hand, you've got a very large twin engine warbird. And on the other hand, you have a small foam park flyer, but <laughs> they're, they're the two shining stars I have in my, my design, uh, you know, back or in my design history. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, those, um, I've tried to design some very unique airplanes and, and going after scale projects, I've tried to avoid direct competition with some of the guys out there that have a really good reputation. You know, Jerry Bates right. being one that he's very well known in the Warbird community. I don't want to go against him. I, I don't, I don't want the competition. I'd rather he and I take on different projects and put two planes out instead of both of us putting a Mustang out. Right. You yeah. Know, that, that kind of approach. Oh, cool. Um, so, so yeah, nice. I did some indoor flyers, um, based on some of the vintage designs I liked, like the chaos and the, the DeBolt live wire. And those got to be a little popular too, for a couple of years there. So that was another nice. one I was kind of proud of. Okay. Cool. Very good. Um, how about this? Let's go with your, uh, we'll kind of close out this interview before the lightning round, of course, um, with the top five, your top five models. I know that's going to be hard to do. And I know it, let's say that it's not a definitive list, but for right now, what are the top, the five uh, airplane models that you like most? That I've built? Your choice. Ooh. You're the guest. Ooh. Well, like well, I said, the, my Curtis Helldiver by far is my benchmark model. Um, right. I haven't built anything quite yet that that measured up to it. Um, mm -hmm. Several years ago, I got a hold of a slightly damaged Hangar 9 Cessna ARF, which is was their, their bigger version, their 20cc 95-inch model. Mm -hmm. And I was, I took that and I stripped it down and fixed it up and then refinished it and painted it like the Cessna that my, both my father and my sister earned their pilot's license in. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's that orange and brown sixties paint job. And that one to <laughs> me is, is just very special. Um, yeah. And it, and it turned out really well. So I would have to say that one's, that one's number two on my list. Um, mm -hmm. Boy, trying to trying to narrow down the the rest. I've always had a soft spot for the GB. I've mm -hmm. come really close to building one. I've actually had a couple kits that I got partway finished, but I never got one to the finish line. Um, that by far is one I have to do. I I have to do before I'm out of the hobby for whatever reason. I have to get a GB done. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so. With that said, I passed on building one this winter to do this Curtis Golf Hawk biplane, but yeah. Okay. It's neither here nor there, but. I'm trying to see if it's um, right around. Yeah. Boy, trying to nail down the, the others is, is tough. There's been a lot of uh, good planes, and there's a lot of good ones out there that I still would like to do. Um, I really have a soft spot for the racers. Um so like mm -hmm. Bob Odegaard's Super Corsair would be high on my list. Um, I'd really like to do a big T-34 Mentor. Um, that's an airplane that I think is very undermodeled. And okay. um, I guess a, an honorable me mention to the list then would be a Stearman. Um, I got an opportunity as a young kid to get a ride in a Stearman. It's mm -hmm. a very vivid memory to me that I'll, I'll hopefully have forever. And the Stearman's always been special to me for that matter. But again, I like to build un more unique subjects and the Stearman is an airplane everybody knows and everybody recognizes. So it's just mm -hmm. never gotten to the top of the list. Um, but someday, someday I've got to do one. Uh, I didn't realize that the 34 Mentor looks a lot like, like almost like a, cr a crushed um, T6 
uh, trainer. Kind of. A Harvard. It's, act- it's like- actually basically a militarized bonanza. Okay. It's, okay, I see it it's now. A basic, <laughs> it's a strengthened bonanza airframe with a two-seat tandem cockpit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Cool. Nice. You got a good selection there, my friend. Good selection of planes that are on your top, for sure. Okay. Dang it, Matt. What I do? <laughs> He's editing, and I'm, I'm I added a picture and messed everything up. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that, <laughs> that list is shit. that list is very fluid. It changes daily, but there's there's some <laughs> that always seem to kind of stay right at the top. So. Yeah. Yeah. I figured nothing you had a handful. Of no, nothing at all. Not wrong at all. Nice. All right. All right. Uh, it has, I believe, come to that part of the show because we have been talking and rambling and going all over the place for over, probably a little over two hours. Let's hit it up with a lightning round. Um, oh, mm-hmm. I forgot uh, I was subjecting to- myself to this. <laughs> yeah, you've, uh, yeah, you've listened to enough episodes to know this was coming. Yeah, yeah. I should have. You don't have an nope. excuse, my friend. You don't have one. No. Nope. <laughs> All right. It's okay. They're not that bad, generally. Right. Well, Bring around. And, uh, and then we can work on getting out of here. Uh, Matt, you want to start it off? Yeah, as you know, Tony, for those who are, if you're just tuning in, this is Lightning Round. It is basically a simple this or that or a couple quick choices. We want Tony to come up with the first uh, answer that comes up to his head and shout that out. Well, he doesn't have to shout, but uh, let's just know what that is. And we're going to get started with sitter stand. Stand. Balsa, composite, or foam? I, I am really liking the foam, balsa, composite type of building. Nice. So the, the nice. foam ball is a hybrid, I'll call it. Okay. All right. Pinch yeah, your thumb. We can come. Pinch. Electric or fuel? Ooh. <laughs> so I've always loved gas engines, but I am nearly 100% electric at this point just based on the convenience. <laughs> so I'm gonna nice. say electric. I'm I'm going that direction. I like it. Scale flying or free flight? What's that? Scale flying or free flight? Scale. Okay. Spectrum, Futaba, etc. Uh, basically, name brand or open source. Boy, 15 years with Spectrum, they never treated me bad, but I'm in year number two with my Radio Master, and I love it. So I'm going to say open source. All right. I think I know the answer to this one, but build or fly? Build. Your favorite wonder variant? Specifically, Specifically the Spawn's wonder. Ooh, I'm going to say, boy, that one's tough, too. I went into this whole project liking the Russian, but I really like the German now. Okay. German wonder. Pusher or tractor? A tractor. Uh, Only because I see it behind you. Exacto knife or bandsaw? Oh. Boy. It depends what you're cutting, because if it's balsa, <laughs> I don't want to cut with a knife, but the the knife works a lot better on foam board. It does. We'll say situational. Situational right. is good. Nice. <laughs> uh, repair or new? New. And the one I know you've been fearing, creamy or chunky? Can I say none? <laughs> you told me you don't eat peanut butter? Not very often, but I would say when I do, I prefer chunky. What if you add some honey to it? No. Or mar- Bananas? No, no. No marshmallow fluff, fluff either. Ugh. Raisins? <laughs> no. The answer is no. The no. answer is no, now we know. Jelly. Peanut butter and jelly, that's that's the extent of anything you put with it. 
<laughs> okay. okay. We learned a lot about Tony today, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, did. Don't feed me peanut butter. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> well, when you come down, See, to, when you come to flight test and we all hang out, I'm not going to fix you a PB and J. We're that, going to get some better stuff. Right. Yeah. That's fine. It just means I won't have to share my giant jug of great value. Uh, creamy peanut butter that I'm sure to bring with me because I eat it out of the jar as a snack. All you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well done. That, that awkward <laughs> silence. Yeah. Tony, I, is there I anything I ain't going to you... fight you one bit for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything you'd like to say to uh, friends or, or point them in a direction where they can see some of the work you've done? Yeah, I've I've got a website. It's dynamic-rc.com if you're curious about any of my designs um or want to track and see what I'm building or working on. I've got links there to everything. Um every plan set I've ever drawn is there for free. Um I'm not awesome. trying to sell plan sets and make money or anything like that. I want to see guys build. Um that's my whole goal is I want to see guys build airplanes. I I want to see that art stay strong so yeah mm. uh is there is there a way they can reach out to you uh, is there a link I've, in there there's a link or you can click there to get a uh, to email me directly from there otherwise okay. i'm quite active on both your discord and the rc plane lab um and i'm easy to find on rc groups i'm easy to find on facebook or at least i try to be um and the flight test forums as well so and it's flying tiger with a Y in the tiger, right? That is correct. Excellent. Now, is that is that named? Where did that come from? One last question. Did that come from like the <laughs> flying tigers from the Warhawk? It kind of. So growing up being named Tony, I got called mm -hmm. Tony the Tiger a lot. And yeah. when it came to trying to find a, a username, um, I especially being interested in warbirds flying tiger just kind of came to mind but right spelled traditionally that username is taken on about every website imaginable <laughs> yeah, <imagine>. so <laughs> so that's okay. where the why comes from so. that's, that makes sense makes perfect sense thank you for answering that yeah. all right um if there's nothing else tony i think i'll let uh, joe take this one away sounds really? good i was gonna let you do it this time Oh man! Or do we want to let Tony do it? Tony, you do can you do you think you can do it? You've listened it. to what all seventy episodes, right? Sixty nine of them. That doesn't mean I remember the outro. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, the right, next time ahead. on RC no, Round, no. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, guys. Uh, well, as well Always, well thank played. you for tuning in and listening. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this conversation as much as we've enjoyed having it. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, tomatoes to throw at us, you can email us, aviationrcnoob at gmail.com. You can uh, reach Matthew with those rotten tomatoes at hey. uh, Matt Matthew at aviationrcnoob at gmail.com, and you send all the flowers and uh, fresh freshly pressed $20 bills to Joe at Aviation <laughs> RC Noob. Uh, no, Joe at Aviation RC Noob. Mm -hmm. com. There we go. Uh, feel free to swing by the Discord or our Facebook page. we got some build nights coming up. Uh, a shout out to our Patreons who keep us uh, powered up and the lights turned on. Uh, Matthew, did I miss anything? Uh, where do they go to be a patron? Uh, patreon.com slash aviation rc new okay thank you think. yep that's it uh and then otherwise uh, if you could if you can't help that way you can always help by sharing the podcast with people who you think would be interested uh we'd love to reach out to new people and get them interested in the hobby uh hopefully you're of the same ilk uh, otherwise no i have nothing else thanks so much tony for joining us today yeah, it's been and fun. i'm glad you you're doing this challenge i'm excited to be part of it for sure yeah let's get some guys building yeah. Cool. All right, guys. If there's nothing else, nope. we will see y'all next time. Bye. Bye. That's your cue, Tony. Bye. <laughs> there we <laughs> go. <laughs> Sorry. Is it cool? And and I'm Tony. Oh no, wrong podcast again. <laughs> <laughs> da 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 da. da. Cool.
last night, essentially. Mm-hmm. But, like... With March 3rd, it's which win- is... It's, it's, it's yeah. Wednesday. I know. It's, it's Wednesday. Wednesday. No, it's not March 3rd yet. It's March 1st. But, right. But it will be in two right. days, which means when you're listening to this, it'll be a day it, ago. That's what I'm getting at. Like, I guess I could have said nothing and let that fly, and it would have sounded much cooler I, than if I had pointed out that it is indeed Wednesday, you know, and it's not, it's not here yet. It's okay. I just had a... You, you oh. got to keep them in check every now and then anyway. <laughs>